talk about waiting and patience. 84 years old she lived after having her husband for seven years. Then he died, and the life of a widow in the first century was not a life to be envied because she was poor and destitute probably unless she had a male relative to care for her. Where is she all these years? Sitting in the temple waiting for God to be revealed. Wow. And also Simeon, an older man, who picks up a baby. This is something you did not see happen. You didn't even pick up your own child if you were a man in those days outside the home. I'm sure inside the home it was different. My mother-in-law was a Southern Baptist lady who deferred to her husband outside the home, but in there she was the boss. Make no mistake about it. And if she said, change that baby, he changed that baby. I tell you that right now. But it could have been the way that was in the olden days, but I'm not sure if it was or not because we don't know what it was like outside the home, inside the home, but outside the home the fathers did not touch children. Here is Simeon in the temple picking up a baby, a stranger's baby, and holding him up and saying, wow, this is God's salvation. I've seen it, my own eyes. Pretty amazing stuff, huh? What else do we see in this story that we know about the baby and his parents? Ah, they're called his parents. Joseph is referred to as his father. Sometimes I've said when Joseph, the father of Jesus, and people say, nope, 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 it was his stepfather, it was his earthly father. It says here his father. Not saying that God was not his father, but saying that God recognized Joseph as a powerful influence in this baby's life. We know that Joseph has taken him, will take him soon and run to Egypt to protect him. We also know that they're poor because they give the gift that is reserved for the poorest of the poor, which is a pair of pigeons or turtle doves to be offered at the temple of sacrifice. Begs the question, though, why are we here today? What does this have to do with us 2,000 some years later? Let me ask you, why do you come to church? It's not a rhetorical question. I want some answers here. Why do you come to church? What are you coming for? Solace in prayer. That is a good reason. Any other reasons? To worship God. Amen. What else? Community, what else? So the presence of God here more than you do in other places. Stained glass was meant to give us light from heaven. That's why you see it. And people will come in here into this building in the afternoon. I wish you all could be here in the afternoon and see the light coming through this window. It's incredible how it just lights up the sanctuary and it's beautiful. People who don't even believe will come in and be stopped by the, the beauty of the windows. Sometimes people say to me, I come to church to feel good, and I think, well, that's not necessarily the best answer. How many of you come to your marching orders for the world? That's what I do. How many of you come here because you just can't imagine being anywhere else? Have you ever had that feeling? Well, I want to tell you some things that have happened through the years that made me really see God in the world. And they're not things that I did, even though I'm in the stories, in two of these stories, because it was the Holy Spirit, I tell you, that was acting through me at the time. One of my congregations wanted to do something for the soldiers during the Iraq War. And we had a woman in the congregation who had left the military because she had her second baby, and she was out then. She was also a nurse, and she wanted to do something for this group of soldiers. So we contacted someone in the United Methodist Church in the Baltimore-Washington Conference who was serving in Iraq as a chaplain. He said, well, we have 856 soldiers here, but we can't get anything for all 856. We know that. But what if you did something for the 56 of us in the command center? And we decided we were going to send each of them a dozen cookies and bought a little box of something something nice for Christmas. I stood in the pulpit to announce it, and I said, but what about the other 800, or 900, it was 956 actually, 956 soldiers. I said, come on, it couldn't be that hard to bake a dozen cookies for 956 soldiers, could it? It was the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you, it was not me. I had no idea, because I don't do math. And somebody in the back said, you were an English major. I just did the math. That's 11,400 cookies. I said, okay, what's 11,000 cookies between us? We got a couple hundred people here. 
And we started baking cookies. People said, this is nuts, this is crazy, we can't do it, 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 can't do it. We need a little positivity there. We cannot possibly do this. We didn't do it. You know how many? We baked 14,000 cookies. And every soldier got a box with playing cards and hot sauce because they said the food was so bad they just wanted hot sauce to pour all over. We contacted businesses, people helped us. The mailman was astounded when we took all those boxes to be mailed. Cost a lot of money, but we had money. We went to Sam's Club to buy the things for the cookies. People said, "Why are you? What are you doing? You're opening a bakery." We told them what we were doing. People were handing us twenty-dollar bills, hundred-dollar checks. Strangers started coming to church. Luckily, the principal of the local high school and the chief cook were members of the congregation. I said, "Could we bake in your kitchen?" They said, "You bet you can." We baked eight hundred cookies the first night with the youth group. The youth group said, "It's not fair because we ate one because you have to underbake cookies to mail them that far that long." Uh, had, we ate one to see if we had underbaked it enough, and it was like, blah. And the kids said, that's not fair, you get to eat them, we don't. By the end of that evening, no kid wanted a cookie. Nobody had a cookie in their home all that Christmas, but we baked 14,000 cookies to send. And people started believing that God, with, all, with God, nothing is impossible. I moved to the next church, and they were doing what we did here, which is an angel tree sort of project. We were helping kids in a school, and we'd start by saying, how many kids can we do this year? And they'd say, maybe we can do 15, maybe we can do 20. So I stood up and said, the Holy Spirit said it through me. It wasn't me. I'm telling you, it was not me. It was not me. The Holy Spirit said, what if we ask God how many people need help instead of starting with what we think we can do? What if we just said that whoever comes to us for help will help and we'll find a way? And guess what? 118 people came to us for help that year, and we had enough to feed 118 Christmas dinners complete with turkeys and also gifts wrapped for their kids because we started with what God asked us to do instead of what we thought we were capable of because God knows that with God nothing is impossible and then there's another story I'm not in this one so it's not about me I'm telling you that truth there is a backpack program in Berkeley County, West Virginia, that was started by one woman who heard the story of her friend who was a teacher in Berkeley County, West Virginia. There was a little girl in her class, and her jacket was so filthy dirty, she thought it could walk home on its own. And she bought her a little coat, even though you're not supposed to do that. Teachers, you know you do that, right? You buy things that kids need. She bought this little girl a coat took it in, and on Friday she said, let me have your jacket and I'll give you this and you can take it for the weekend and I'll wash your jacket and bring it back. The little girl said, no, I want my coat. Please don't take my coat. Please do not take my coat. And she cried and the teacher had to wrestle it from her with a new coat on her and send it home and she went home to wash it, emptied the pockets and found the bread from everybody's lunch because everybody in the class saved their bread for her because they knew she had nothing to eat on weekends. She had a pocket full of bread from sandwiches and from school lunch and everything else. The teacher's heart was broken and she went instead to her friends and they got together and they started a backpack program which is still going in Berkeley County. They feed hundreds of kids on weekends. Every Friday they gather at a local school. People from churches, people who don't believe in God, people who don't believe in anything come together because they believe kids are hungry and they feed them every week. It's been going on for years now. Because one little girl had a dirty coat and a teacher decided to wash it for her. But she didn't stop there, did she? She saw the possibilities because with God, nothing is impossible. Simeon and Hannah came every day to the temple waiting for salvation, waiting to see God. Simeon sees a baby and says, I can die in peace now. Take me, Lord. Take me now. So like Fred Sanford going, I'm coming, Elizabeth, remember that? I think that's where he got that idea from this story, because take me now, God, I've seen my salvation. And Anna, the poorest of the poor, rejoicing in this little baby, seeing the Savior in him. They went every day looking and waiting and waiting and hoping and hoping and waiting, but expecting that God was going to act. And when God acted, they recognized it and they change their world. We already know coming in the door that Jesus is the Savior, don't we? Isn't that why you're here this morning, to worship God? To worship him. How do we worship? By giving our all to God.
We give of ourselves, we give our offerings, we give our service, we give our lives, our hearts, our minds, our souls, our strength to serve God together. It pains me to think that this could be my last sermon ever. I mean, I'm planning to come back, but that depends on what the doctor and neurologist find out and everything else. But I tell you, I'm going to serve as long as I'm able. I will serve till I can serve no longer because I can't do anything else because this building and any building that looks like it represents for me where I can go and find family, not just community, but family, because my family has shrunk to nothing just about now. I lost both parents since I moved here five years ago. My husband is with Christ now full time. But you're my family. And you'll be the family of the next pastor who comes here, whether it's an appointed pastor or an interim pastor, whatever it is. You will find family in each other. And if you don't, shame on you. If you don't, shame on you. Because that is who we're called to be for one another. Just as Joseph was called to be the earthly father of Jesus, we're called to father and mother and brother and sister each other when no one else can do anything. I got a class of people this morning. Rob Hiddle, God bless this man. He's back there running everything this morning. He finished the PowerPoint for me after I shook so much that I knocked out some of it and didn't get it all done. He came in my house yesterday with Paul, Noah, and Malachi, who moved furniture from my mother's house to my house yesterday. We've got Charlie Brown and Linus here this morning who helped last Sunday with the service. It was beautiful. I watched it yesterday. I watched you guys up here acting and dancing and everything else. For all this stuff on my desk, some people loved the picture I put on Facebook of my desk on Christmas Eve covered with gifts, cookies, mm. <laughs> Caroline, Caroline, yours are gone already, and Arlise with her peppermint bark, which is my favorite thing at Christmas time, other than Jesus being born, is peppermint bark. The cards that I get from you, the, the love that you pour into me has changed my world, and I want to thank you for that this morning. We're going to just, we're going to sing What Child Is This in a moment, and then we're going to invite anybody who would like to be prayed on for healing, and I want somebody to anoint me as well, because I need healing in my life. If you want to be healed, whether it's physical, you have a physical problem, come and sit on the front pew. If it's spiritual healing that you need, come up, because some people have said to me, I don't like so-and-so, and I can't fix that, but Jesus can, I'm telling you that right now or if it's emotional healing, if you just can't let go of something in your past, if you can't forgive someone. Forgiveness is the root of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Come and be healed and let it go once and for all and enter the new year as a new person in Christ your Lord and Savior. What child is this who's laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? This is Christ the King. So let us give thanks and sing. Would you please stand and join in singing number 219 from the United Methodist Hymnal, What Child Is This? <laughs> 